believe we left off um, <clears throat> around pages 4, 12, or so. <clears throat> Let me back up. We very, very briefly went over what happened when Abner Snopes and his youngest son, Sardi, showed up at Major Despain's house. So let's, let's kind of back up to there, pages 410 and 411. Um, no, take that back. That's four. Four oh nine is where that begins. So they're walking up the big long avenue, and you've got a picture of oh, okay, right off there. You've got a picture of Faulkner's house um, at the beginning of the Faulkner section. And, and you see the long, you know, the, the row of oak trees or pecan trees, whatever they are. And so that kind of gives you an idea of what he's described with Major Despain's house. So he walks, walks up this long avenue, and there's, you know, a pile of horse dung. And we get the description from Sardi's perspective. You know, he walks, and he could have stopped, taken one step to the side, Taking a step, gone around it, and gone on up to the house. But he doesn't. He steps right in. Now, when he does that, is does that have a plan? Does he know what he's going to do? Does he know he's going to step through the door and find this nice cream-colored rug that came from uh, France that he's going to foul? No, he doesn't. This just shows his dogged determination okay, to never waver, to never vary in any way. Okay? So he goes up, knocks on the door, servant comes, answers the door, says the master's not here, or Major Spain isn't here, and he calls for Mrs. Spain. Abner steps in, steps on the rug, she tells him to leave, and he does this. He drags the foot that has fresh droppings on it, around like this, and inscribes a half-circle brown mark, okay? So, um, they leave the house, page 410, and Abner says some things about what produced the house, okay? Bottom of 410. Pretty and white, ain't it? That's sweat. Nigger sweat. Maybe it ain't white enough yet to suit him. Maybe he wants to mix some white sweat with it. Okay? What's this tell us about Abner? Does it tell us he's a racist, that he's prejudiced? Maybe. Think of the setting. It's the 1890s. Okay? All too, happen, all, all too often, in, I was going to say 20th century, in the 21st century, we read our modern ideas, modern values, modern morality back into something that was written a lot earlier. In this case, you know, it's not written a lot earlier. This is written, what year? 1939, okay? But it's set a hundred and... 130 years ago, okay? Totally different time. Totally different set of values. It's, it's wrong to try to take our modern mentality and fit it on something. We've got to read it in the time in which it is set. It'd be the same thing if we were talking about something written in the 15th century or uh, not the 1000th century, the 10th century, thousands. Or, for example, when we go back to in oh, uh, next week, yeah, today's Wednesday. Next week, when we start um, Sophocles, 2,500 years ago. If we try to read Sophocles through our modern mindset, we're going to miss 90% of what Sophocles is saying. Okay? So, they go on back home, and the boy's chopping wood. 
and the rug is brought back to him. He's told to clean it. And how does he clean it? He gets the lye soap, lye is an acid. I think I mentioned this the other day. It's really good for dissolving bodies. You know, if you want to go off into a serial murder kind of thing. He takes this lye soap and a big stone. And he puts the soap on the rug and he starts rubbing it with the stone. This would be like washing clothes in a river. You beat them against rock to loosen the dirt and stuff, and then, you know, rinse them in the water and such. It's essentially what he's doing. But what he does is he takes the nap of the rug, you know, the, the thickness of the fibers of the rug, down from what's maybe an inch to like a quarter of an inch. He just destroys it, essentially, right? So, skip a little bit more. He sends the rug back, or takes the rug back. Page 413. We have another trial. All right? Another justice of the peace. Different one. Different county. And we hear the justice say, middle of 413. Burnt. Do I understand this rug was burned too? He's thinking lit on fire burnt. Does anybody here claim it was? Abner says, go back to the wagon. And you claim 20 bushels of corn is too high for the damage you did to the rug. Uh, back up for a moment. Go to the middle of 412. Major Despain is talking to Abner. You must realize you have ruined that rug. Wasn't there anybody here, any of your women? It cost $100. The rug cost $100. But you never had $100. You never will. So I'm going to charge you 20 bushels of corn. Now, what if he did charge him for $100? What would happen to Abner? He couldn't pay it, right? He'd go to jail. Would he be able to pay it once he's in jail? No. He would have no way to make any money. So he'd be in jail the rest of his life. So Major Despain says, I'm going to charge you 20 bushels of corn against your crop. Remember the other day, you know, I had this, and let's say this is 20 acres by 20 acres, so you have 400 acres total. And let's say of that 400, he gets, I don't know, five acres. He's got to produce so many bushels of corn from all of this, but now, He's got to produce 20 bushels of corn just from his pot that he is allowed to work for himself and his family. That's on top of what he has to produce to feed himself and his family. Okay? Talk about getting blood from a turnip kind of an idea. So he says, I'm going to charge you 20 bushels of corn against your crop. I'll add it in your contract, and when you come to the commissary, you can sign it. That won't keep Mrs. Despain quiet, but it will teach you to wipe your feet before you enter her house again. Notice, her house, not my house, her house. Okay? So they leave, they go back home. Who has started or brought this trial? into being that's at the bottom of 412 and 413. Is this major to Spain suing essentially Abner Snopes? No, it's the other way around. Abner has brought to Spain to court because he's saying 20 bushels is too high a charge. I can't afford that. I'll never be able to afford that. Top of 413. Sardi's thinking Maybe this is the end of it. Maybe even that 20 bushel seems hard to have to pay for just a rug. Will be a cheap price for him to stop forever and always for being what he used to be. Notice that stream of consciousness. There's no grammar there. There's no sentence structure. Maybe he won't even collect the 20 bushels. 
maybe it will all add up and balance and vanish. And maybe the tooth fairy will come and put 20 pound, $20, you know, under his pillow at night. This is telling us, you know, Sardi's kind of thinking pie in the sky kind of stuff here. Corn, rug, fire, the terror and grief, the being pulled two ways, like between two teams of horses, gone, done with forever and ever. What's he mean being told, being pulled two ways? What are the two things that are pulling Sardi, the little boy? One of them we were introduced to in the opening paragraph of the short story. The old fierce pull of blood, family, you got to stick with family. What's the other one? Yes, a sense of morality. What if your family is screwed up? What if your family is, you know, Hitler? You stick with them no matter what? Okay, the correct answer obviously is no. You abandon them, all right? If you have a sense of right and wrong, okay? That's what he's torn between. And he, the reason I said the pie in the sky kind of solution is he's hoping his father will kind of miraculously become good overnight. That, then it was Saturday. Okay. And so they set up the wagon, go back into town. And we're told that mid, that first kind of long paragraph, 413, he mounted the gnawed steps behind his father and brother. And there again was the lion the lane of quiet watching faces for the three of them to walk through. The court is set up. It's another uh, general store. A bunch of men, and they kind of, you know, part way for them to walk through. He saw the man in spectacles sitting at the plank table. He did not need to be told this was a justice of the peace. Plank table, I think, implies this isn't a real table. This is like two sawhorses and a couple of planks set up. And they made a judge's bench. Okay. He sent one glare of fierce, exultant, partisan defiance at the man in collar and cravat now, that is Ty. He's looking at Major Despain, whom he had seen but twice before in his life. And that on a galloping horse, who now wore on his face an expression, you know, which the boy could not have known was at the incredible circumstance of being sued by one of his own tenants. See, the boy doesn't know. The narrator tells us this. So this is editorial omniscience. The boy doesn't know that the reason they're there is because his father called for a justice of the peace and stood against his father and cried at the justice, he ain't done it, he ain't burnt, dot, dot, dot. What's the dot, dot, dot for? He doesn't finish his sentence, right? What can we maybe assume or infer he was going to say? He hasn't burnt any barns, has he? He hasn't burnt any barns here at least yet. Go back to the wagon. Another shot. Burnt? Justice says. Do I understand this rug was burned too? Does any in his father? Did anybody claim it? Notice Major to Spain has suggested that. Go back to the wagon, he tells his boy. So, you claim 20 bushels of corn is too high for the damage you did to the rug. Notice Abner's defense. He brought the rug to me, said he wanted the tracks washed out. I washed the tracks out and took it back to him. Sounds like a pretty logical defense, right? But you didn't carry the rug back to him in the same condition it was in before you made the tracks on it. Now, what could Abner say? How could he respond to that? That's not what he asked me to do. He didn't say, return the rug in the condition in which it was before you stepped on it. He just said, get the tracks out of it. I mean, literally, 
He could have taken a pair of scissors and cut those fibers down really, really low. Track's gone. Well, the track I made in it is gone. Now it has a different track in it. But he doesn't do that. You declined to answer that, Mr. Snopes? I'm going to find against you, Mr. Snopes. I'm going to find that you are responsible for the injury to Major Spain's rug and hold you liable for it. But 20 bushels of corn seems a little high for a man in your circumstances to have to pay. Notice that beautiful euphemism, in your circumstances. What does he mean? He's not in a good spot financially, I guess he's in life in general. For somebody who's dirt poor. I mean, he fits that term literally, dirt poor. He's too poor to own even dirt, okay? So he says, I'm not gonna hold you liable for the entire 20 pounds, 20 bushels. All right, Major to Spain claims it costs $100. October corn will be worth about 50 cents a bushel. That is 50 cents a bushel of corn. 50 cents times 20 is what? Half of 20 is 10. I figure that if Major to Spain can stand a $95 loss on something he paid back cash for, you can stand a $5 loss you haven't earned yet. I hold you in damages to Major to Spain to the amount of 10 bushels of corn, okay? Over and above your contract with them. He's just cut in half the charge that's been levied against him by Major to Spain. But notice what Major to Spain essentially loses. He loses $95 on this. The rug costs 100. He's getting 10 bushels of corn, which is worth $5. Is this quote unquote equal justice? Not really, but Major to Spain has circumstances, let's use the judge's term, that what? That say he can swallow a $95. Abner can't swallow a 10 bushel, $5 loss, okay? Court adjourned. So he brings the suit. Does he lose entirely? No. No, he comes out a lot better than he was before the suit happened. He still has to come up with an extra 10 bushels out of whatever. We don't know what size his plot is. Okay, so they go back home. His father asks the older son, did you get the oil? And he did it and stuff, okay. So they go back home, bottom of 414. Eat supper by lamplight. The boy watches the night, you know, descend, so to speak. And then he hears his mother. No, no, oh God, oh heck God, Ebner. And he gets up and he goes inside and he sees his father still in the hat and coat that he was wearing earlier in the day, at once formal and burlesque as though dressed carefully for some shabby and ceremonial violence, emptying the reservoir of the lamp back into the five gallon kerosene can from which it had been filled. So he takes the candle or the wick out of the lamp, the lamp base, he pours the oil that's in there, the kerosene, back into the five gallon can. Why? Is he being thrifty? No, he's gonna use it. While the mother tugs at his arm, she knows what's happening. And he tells Abner, go to the barn and get that can of oil we were oiling the wagon with. You know, to oil the springs and the wheels, the axles to keep it from squeaking and such. He doesn't move. What, what? Go get that oil. Go! And the boy runs. Top of 415. 
This the old habit. What's the old habit? The old blood, which he had not been permitted to choose for himself, which had been bequeathed him willy-nilly, and which had run for so long, and who knew where, battening on what of outrage and savagery and lust before it came to him. What's the old habit? It's not the old blood that's being talked about. That's the, that's the fierce pull of blood, having to obey God his father, having to follow his father, having to look up to his father. I think the habit is, this isn't the first time he's been told to go to the barn. If we could take what was said earlier about the fact that they've had to move at least 12 times in his lifetime, and if we can you know, go back to maybe his earliest memories, four or five years old, I think the implication is he's done this several times. But notice, this is the first time he thinks, I can keep on. That is, he's running towards the barn. I could not stop at the barn. I can keep running. I can run on and on and never look back. Never need to see his face again. Only I can't. Why? Because that blood is like rope around his waist pulling him. The rest they can in his hand now. So, while he's thinking this, he's got to the barn, he's got the can, he's turned around, he's going back to the shack. The liquid sploshing in it as he ran back to the house. He can't even go to the meter. What do you mean? Aren't you even going to warn them? What did he do, apparently, for Mr. Harris? He, Abner, he sent a warning. Remember the warning? Blood and hay, oh, blood. Hay and wood can burn. That was the warning. Be careful. This time the father didn't strike him. The hand came even faster than the blow had. The same hand which had set the can on the table with most excruciating care. He grabs him. He doesn't slap him. Grabs him. <laughs> Empty the can in the big one. Go on, I'll catch up with you. He tells the older brother. Notice the older brother is never named. The two sisters never named. The mother is named. Okay. The aunt is named. The father is named. The youngest son is named. Better time up to the bedpost, older brother says. Do like I told you. And he's moving out. And the father takes him to his mother. To where his mother and aunt sat, sat, bleh, sat side by side on the bed. The aunt's arms about his mother's shoulders wide. Why is um, the sister comforting Sar uh, Sardi's mother. No, sorry, I gave it away. Why is she holding her? Because she's comforting her. She's consoling her. Hold him. The aunt starts, not you, Lenny. That's Abner, sorry, that's Sardi's mother's name. Lenny, take hold of him. I want to see you do it. That works on multiple levels. The obvious level is he wants her to do what? Keep him there. Keep him there. What's another level of, of kind of meaning there? Keeping Sardi there does what for Abner? It's protection, right? He's saying, you don't hold him. Fact, he actually comes up and says it. Take hold of him. I want to see you do it. And she grabs him by the wrist. You'll hold him better than that. If he gets loose, don't you know what he's going to do? If he gets loose, what's he going to do? He's going to run and tell. What will happen? If he runs and tells, and we get caught. They're dead. 
What's he really saying? I hold him. You don't hold him. I and your eldest son are going to die. Whose fault will that be? In Abner's way of thinking. Hers. For not holding. Sorry. Whose fault in reality will that be? Yeah. His. He's the agent. He's the actor here. Okay? Don't you know what he's going to do? He'll go up yonder. And he says, maybe I should tie him. I'll hold him. See you do. And then he leaves. And Sardi says, let me go. I don't want to have to hit you. And Lizzie, the aunt, says, let him go. Why? This she doesn't say this. This is what I think, what Faulkner intends us to understand. This needs to stop. This what? What has Abner been engaged in for at least 10 years? This cycle of violence. It just keeps going. It doesn't stop. He's done it at least 12 times. This is the at least 13th time. Is he going to reform after this? No, no, he's not. Abner is a candidate for long-term incarceration. Okay. Let him go. If you don't, before God, I am going up there myself. Don't you see I can't? Why? Is she blood related to Abner? Eh, we hope not. But it is the old fierce pull of blood. Her marriage to him. She knows, if I let him go, my husband's dead. Who will quote unquote provide for her? This is another way of, you know, not reading a 21st century mentality into something set in the 1890s. Because the 21st century mentality would say, well, she can be a free woman then. She can go out and make her own life. No, she can't. That is a lie. She would have zip, no life, no one to care for her. Plus, she'll have two daughters to care for. Is she going to be able to share crop on her own? Don't you see I can't? And then he was free. Catch him, catch him. But he runs. He runs up. He runs to the door. Bangs on it. The servant appears. To Spain. Top of 416. Where's Barn? Barn. What? And now to Spain shows up. Barn. Okay. Usual. You know, we used to say to our kids when they were little. Use your words. <laughs> More words than that. Yes, barn. Catch him. Does he really need to say more? If he just keeps saying barn, 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 that means you better go check your barn. Okay? And he runs. To Spain calls for his horse. He gets his horse. He gets on his horse. The boy runs back down the drive, the avenue. Blood and breath, roaring, panting loudly. Why blood? If you're an athlete, if you've been an athlete, if you've done anything remotely athletic, you get that heart pumping and you feel that blood pumping. I can feel my blood pressure actually in my ears. It's especially when I'm really pumping, okay? He couldn't hear either. Why? Because of that. And he hears Major Despain come galloping past him. Just past the middle of the page, in that long paragraph in the middle, he hears a long, swirling roar, incredible and soundless. 
blotting the stars, and he's springing up and into the road again. Because he jumps off the road as the speed rides by. Right? Running again, knowing it was too late, yet still running, even after he heard the shot. And an instant later, two shots. Pausing now without knowing, he had ceased to run, crying, Pip, Pip. And then later, Father, Father. What are the three shots? Dad and brother. They're dead. We're not told they're dead, but it's pretty clear they're dead. At midnight, he was sitting on the crest of a hill. Why? What did he not do? He didn't go back home. He didn't go back home. What's happened to that old fierce pull of blood? He broke it. He broke the rope. He did not know it was midnight. He did not know how far he had come. But there was no glare behind him now. And he sat now, his back toward what he had called home for four days. What does it mean? There was no glare behind him now. There were no lights. Possibly. What kind of lights would there be in the 1890s? Fire. Keep going. The barn's not on fire. The barn's not on fire anymore. Or what's the other possibility? Possibility. He ran far enough away that he's run so far enough away that you can no longer see the glare from the fire. How far would you have to run to do that? Miles. Miles. Because we're talking 1890s Mississippi. Mississippi's fairly flat. I lived there for four years where I did my PhD. I'm not kidding. When we drove to Mississippi to look at houses and stuff, sorry if any of you are from Mississippi, maybe it's not the same anymore. This was in 1989. It was like going 50 years in the past. We drove. What part did you live in? What part did we live in? Hattiesburg? That's not too so far. Well, it's like two hours from Starkville. Yeah. Yeah, US, USM, Southern Mississippi. But we, I mean, we drove, we got into Mississippi, and I'm not kidding. There was a road crew working on the road, and there had to be 15, 20 black guys working. And this was summer. Summer in Middle Tennessee is not like summer in Mississippi. It totally, totally different. It's nice here compared to Mississippi. And there, be, there had to be like 50 or 20 black guys working on the highway and three or four white guys sitting in the truck. And I was like, blah, 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 there's something wrong with this image. What, what is wrong here? I mean, and it was 9,500 degrees and they're laying asphalt. Okay? The reason I got into all that is it's pretty flat. And so if you imagine at night without any electricity, it's dark. Pitch black dark. So you'd be able to see a barn burning for miles. And he's up on a hill, we're told. So he's on a high spot, and he can't see it. So it's either burned out, which might indicate it's a small fire, small barn, probably not given the size of the description of Despain's house, or they put the fire out, possibility, okay? Or he's run so far that he can't see the glare anymore. His back toward what he had called home for four days anyhow, his face toward the dark woods, which he would enter when breath was strong again. He's painting. His face um, strong again, small, shaking steadily in the chill darkness, hugging himself into the remainder of his thin, rotten shirt. What time of year is it again? It's May. So it's still getting pretty cool at night. And his shirt, we're told, is thin and rotten. It's got holes in it. The grief and despair now no longer terror and fear, but just grief and despair. Terror and fear, part of the reason he ran, was seeking Major Despair is going to come after him too, possibly. But now it's just grief and despair. What's the grief? His father and brother are dead. Despair? What am I going to do? 
And he said, his father, my father, he was bred. He was, he was in the war. He was in Colonel Sartorius Cavalry. The guy he's named after, he was in his cavalry. Was he? The narrator tells us he wasn't. Not knowing that his father had gone to that war a private in the fine old European sense, meaning like the Europeans used to. Wearing no uniform, admitting the authority of, and giving fidelity, that's faith or loyalty, to no man or army or flag. Going to war as Malbrook, and you got a footnote there, okay, himself did for booty, to get what he could out of the war. And we already heard, at least one of the times, one of the things he got out of the war, right? He had a string of horses. Stolen horses. It meant nothing and less than nothing to him if it were enemy booty or his own. And the boy sits there and we're told the constellations wheel on. Time goes by. The earth turns. It would be dawn and then sun up after a while and he would be hungry. But that would be tomorrow. And now he was only cold and Walking would cure that, so he doesn't stop to sleep. His breathing was easier now. He decided to get up and go on, and then he found he had been asleep because he knew it was almost dawn. The night almost over. He could tell that from the whippoorwills. They were everywhere. Lots of description going on of the natural world, right? He gets up. He's a little stiff. Walking would cure that, too. He goes down the hill towards the dark woods within which the liquid silver voices of the birds call. The rapid and urgent beating of the urgent inquiring heart. Quiring means singing of the late spring night. Why all the emphasis on the birds and the singing birds? Almost like a new start to them. That's exactly what it is. It's a new day. It's a new beginning for him. He did not look. And I think that's meant both literally, it doesn't stop and look back from whence he came, but also figuratively, he never looks back. He never mentally goes back in time. He never thinks about all of that. Okay? So you got a bunch of questions if you want to, you know, do more to think about it. Turn to, got a few minutes left. Uh, 361 in your book. We'll finish a good, find, a good man is hard to find on Friday, but we'll at least get started. Read the intro about Flannery O'Connor. Notice she only lives uh, 39 years. She writes several novels and a whole bunch of short stories and some essays. Okay? Gets a Guggenheim Fellowship and, you know, excuse me, she's rejected for a Guggenheim Fellowship. Lectures at universities, goes back, lives in Milledgeville, Georgia. You can go, you can visit her house today, it's like a museum or something. A good man is hard to find. Titles always mean something. You know, Faulkner's Barn Burning gives us an idea of what the story is about. A good man is hard to find. What does that mean? Well, look at the setup. I think there's a biblical reference, which we'll talk about. The grandmother didn't want to go to Florida. A good man is hard to find. Who's a protagonist? Okay. As you read this, ask yourself, who's the protagonist? Who's the protagonist of Barn Burning? <clears throat> sorry, sorry. The little boy. Who's the antagonist? Father. His father. Okay. Who's the who's the protagonist here? And who is the then? 
antagonist. What's the setting? Grandmother didn't want to go to Florida. She wanted to visit some of her connections in East Tennessee. She was seizing it every chance to change Bailey's mind. We're not told exactly where they live yet. It's going to come up very shortly. She was seizing it every chance to change Bailey's mind. Bailey was the son she lived with, her only boy. He was sitting on the edge of his chair at the table, bent over the orange sports section of the journal. That's the Atlanta Constitution and Journal. And she says, look here, Bailey. See here, read this. And she stands and notice the description. Okay. When short story authors and novelists give us a lot of description, they're trying to create this world that we can enter into and believe. It makes it more realistic. I don't know if you've ever seen a woman like this, but I have. I had one grandmother kind of like this. My wife had a grandmother very much like this. And I've met a lot of old Southern women very, very much like this. See here, read this. And she stands with one hand on her thin hip and the other rattling the newspaper at his bald head. Now notice what he's doing. He's sitting at the table trying to read the paper, and she's sitting there going, Look at this. And he just wants to do what? Go away, Mom. Here this fellow calls himself the misfit as a loose from the federal pen headed toward Florida. And you read here what it says he did to these people. Just you read it. I wouldn't take my children any direction with a criminal like that or loose in it. Couldn't answer my conscience if I did. So we find out there's a guy escaped from the federal penitentiary. He's done some apparently horrible things to people. And he is headed towards Florida. She has implied that they are headed towards Florida, but it's not been directly stated yet. Bailey doesn't look up. In other words, he doesn't respond. So she wheels around and faces his mother. Excuse me, the children's mother. A young woman in slacks whose face was as broad and innocent as a cabbage. Now just pause there for a moment and think of that description. But that, by the way, is how this young woman is always described. We never learn her name. We learn the son's name, Bailey. We learn his two eldest children's names. We don't learn the baby's name. We don't learn the grandmother's name. And we don't learn Bailey's wife's name. We don't learn the misfit's real name. We do learn his two accomplices' names. Why isn't the mother named? Well, she's kind of, in one sense, inconsequential. But I think, you know, the narrator is also kind of saying she's just a filler, so to speak. So she has a face as broad and innocent as a cabbage, right? Because cabbages aren't guilty of anything. But what else does it mean? Broad, kind of flat, kind of big face, right? And her head was tied around with a green kerchief that had two points on the top like a rabbit's ears. She's sitting on the sofa feeding the baby. Okay, so we know there's a baby. And the grandmother says, children, have been to Florida before. Y'all ought to take them somewhere else for a change so they would see different parts of the world be broad. They never been to East Tennessee. So notice what being broad, being, you know, travelers means to her. Going to East Tennessee, the hills of East Tennessee. Children's mother didn't seem to hear her. Why? You ever seen any of the old Charlie Brown cartoons that were, you know, would be aired on TV? And every now and then there'd be one where the children are in school and the teacher speaks. What does the teacher sound like? <laughs> Why? That's probably what you all hear. <laughs> because they are tuning the teacher out. That's what the mother is doing here to the grandmother. Okay. So we get introduced to the son. 
an eight-year-old boy, John Wesley, stocky child with glasses. Stocky probably means a little overweight, a little heavy set. And he said to the grandmother, he's eight years old. If you don't want to go to Florida, why don't you stay at home? Now, assuming you have grandmothers, if any of you spoke to your grandmother like that, what would happen? I'd have gotten smacked. If not by either one of my grandmothers, one of my parents, dad probably would have taken me in the other room, pulled the belt off and, you know, literally pulled the belt off. What does this tell us about this boy? He doesn't have very good manners. He's a smart ass. Okay? Which, if he doesn't have very good manners, what does that tell us about his parents? Sorry, that question may betray part of my belief system. Maybe it does in yours. The reason you have children with bad manners is because you have parents with bad manners <laughs> who don't know how to raise their children. He and the little girl, June Star, were reading the funny papers, cartoons, comics. And June Star says she wouldn't stay at home to be queen for a day. Smack. And the grandmother says, well, what would you do if this fellow, the misfit, caught you? I'd smack his face, John Wesley says. She wouldn't stay home for a million bucks, June Star says. Afraid she'd miss some. She has to go everywhere we go. Now Jesus said, out of the mouths of babes, truth is spoken. What truth, maybe, did June Star just say? Grandma never gives them a break, does she? Wherever they go, she's there. I don't know about you, I wouldn't have won my grandma coming, either one of them, coming on every family vacation we had. That would have been like the most extreme downer there could possibly be. That's June Star's point. Okay. There could be another reason, other than maybe the parents aren't the best parents, that June Star and John Wesley are the way they are. And it's the old lady hovering in the background all the time. And there could be, possibly, a reason why, at least, Bailey, the grandmother's son, is the way he is. And it's her. <laughs> all right, miss, just remember that next time you want me to curl your hair. So the next morning, they're in their car, getting ready to go. And notice the grandmother is the first one in the car. She said, we shouldn't go to, and yet she's the first one in the car. Telling us, does she really believe what she read in the newspaper? No. If you really believed there was a serial killer loose in the direction you're going to, would you go in that direction? Probably not. But like June Star said, she wouldn't stay home for a million bucks. Why? Because she's afraid she would miss out on something. Well, she's not going to miss out. So she has her big suitcase. Okay. And underneath that, she has a basket with a cat in it. Pity sink. She didn't want the cat left alone in the house for three days. She's afraid it would miss her too much. She was afraid it might brush against one of the gas burners on the, on the stove and asphyxiate itself, might accidentally turn it on. Okay? She sits in the middle of the back seat. The two older children on either side of her, Bailey driving. The children's mother in the front seat holding the baby. Why? 30 years. 40 years probably, eh, 35 years, before car seats. There weren't any car seats in 1953 when the story was written. 
babysits him. Okay? And we finally find out the specific, the exact, you know, setting. Atlanta. They leave Atlanta at 8.45 in the morning. And the car has mileage, 55,890 miles. Now, in 1953, if, if we take 1953 as the date for the setting of the story also, for a car to have 55,000 55, miles on it, this is probably a really old car. Because people did not drive in the 50s and 40s like we do today. For one reason, there was no interstate system. Eisenhower didn't start the interstate system until about 56. So there was no I-75 going through Georgia. You'd have to take, three, uh, what is it, 301 State Road, State Highway, all right? Grandmother wrote it down. She thought it was interesting. She gets comfortable. Notice how she's dressed. White gloves. Why? 1950s South. She's a lady. This is this, You go on a trip. This is what you do. She's dressed to the nines. She's dressed like for Sunday church. As on the hat, we get description of the dress she's wearing. Navy blue dress with a small white dot in the print. Her collars and cuffs were white organdy trimmed with lace at her neckline. Okay. In case of an accident, anyone seeing her dead on the, on the highway would know at once she was a lady. Notice what is important for her. If she dies, what does she want people to think about her? This was a proper lady. Okay? It's really the most important thing to think about once, you know, kind of you're dead. Anyways, they start. Page 363, John Wesley says, let's go through Georgia fast so we don't have to look at it much. If I were a little boy, I wouldn't talk about my native state that way. Tennessee has the mountains. Georgia has hills. <clears throat> Tennessee is just a hillbilly dumping ground, John Wesley says. And Georgia is a lousy state, too. How old is he? He's eight. What kind of attitude does that reflect? And I'm not talking about bad mannered. What kind of attitude, like, towards life does that show? Louder? Cynical. Cynical. This kid's awful young to be this jaded, to be this down on life. Okay? Grandmother. In my time, children are more respectful of their native states and their parents and everything else. People did right then. Oh, yeah. Everybody knows when that is, right? The good old days. When she was young, we don't know how old she is. Might be safe to assume she's 55 or 60. If this is set in 1955, then she was born 1898, something like that. 1893. They see a little child standing in a doorway. Oh, look at the cute little piccaninny. Staring at the Negro child standing in the door of a shack. And notice what she says. Wouldn't that make a picture now? What does she mean? What did she say just before those two lines? In my day, when I was a child. And then she sees this picture, this image. She sees a little black kid standing in a doorway, and she said, oh, that'd make a wonderful picture. I don't think it's an accident that O'Connor juxtaposes the statement about her youth in this image. Because I think what she's saying is, we need to get back to this. You know. June started. He didn't have any britches on. Little kid's naked. Has a shirt, maybe. Probably didn't have any. No niggers in the country don't have things like we do. If I could, I'd paint that picture. Why? Now this is set probably in 1953. So it's not a, it's not a big stretch to take some of our mentality back into this time frame, because there's a lot of people alive today that were alive then. 
What is she saying? Possibly. I'm not saying directly. This is how things ought to be. The grandmother is not a nice person, folks, if it's not clear to you. Okay. So they keep driving on. They look at a graveyard. Middle of that page, 363. With five or six graves fenced in the middle of it. And we're going to stop there. We're going to pick up with paragraph 25. How many people are in the car? Five, six. Bailey, his wife, his mother, his baby, and his two children. A little bit of foreshadowing. 